This is Chatter. I'm Shane Harris. This week, Jenny Lamette and Alex Kurtzman on The Man Who Fell to Earth. Dr. Mae Jemison, first African-American woman in space. And I asked her, how? How did you get there? And she said, Uhura. I saw Star Trek and I knew that I had to do that. And it hit me in that moment, the enormous responsibility to tell stories that can make a young woman who feels invisible go, I'm gonna go do something impossible. We always knew that the character of Justin, we knew that she had to be a woman of color because we needed a character with a genuine perspective on the planet. We needed to get an honest picture of the landscape. I think that what Jenny and I really do believe is that you can entertain people greatly while also stealth bombing messages into your storytelling that make them think a little bit more about their place in the world. Jenny Lamette and Alex Kurtzman, welcome to Chatter. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us with my caveat and the caveat for your listeners. Um, I have COVID and I've been saying wacky shit. Awesome. This is good. This is a very good note to start on. Thank you. Um, well, you are you are both the the co-creators and the showrunners and the creative forces behind the new Showtime series, The Man Who Fell to Earth, um, which is a story about an alien who comes to Earth because he has left his planet, which has been devastated by, I think, what we would recognize as climate change or some severe changes to their climate. Mm -hmm. Uh, And he has come seeking out a scientist on Earth because she holds the knowledge to unlocking a technology that could help save his planet. And the question is then, can he help her save the planet Earth? I'm not going to give too much away about the story, and it's going in a lot of very interesting directions. I think it's going to keep a lot of people guessing as they watch it. Uh, uh, but it, we wanted you to come on the show because this is very much a story about climate change and planetary existence and the threats of climate change, which rank at the very top of all of the lists that national security officials are always warning about that the planet has to address. And there's there's a scene in the third episode that I wanted to start with that that really I thought kind of captured really not only where the characters are in the show, but where we are right now on this planet. And uh, the alien played by Chuyatel Ejiofor is having a conversation with the scientist played by Naomi Harris, who he has come to enlist. And she's kind of finally on board and believes that he actually is from another planet, because in the beginning, she thinks he might just be an insane person. And she asks him, you know, how much longer do we have? And he says to her that the domino has already tipped. And that by 2030, the temperatures on your planet will basically, they'll be too hot for the human species to survive. And so she's hearing this for the first time. And it struck me that, you know, we are hearing similar messages right now from world leaders saying the window is closing on our ability to do something about climate change. And I just wondered, like, what was the sense of urgency as you all are making this show? Because it can take a long time to get a show made in Hollywood, but this one is landing at exactly, it seems to me, the right moment. So did you feel that kind of urgency to get this show up and running uh, uh, when you started thinking about doing it? Well, I think there are a lot of answers to that question. I think that we were, or I was, and also here's something interesting about this particular show is that whatever that Whatever, and I'm not going to speak for Alex, although sometimes I do speak for him. (laughs) But whatever I think I was writing about at the time, I look back on it now and I think, holy shit, I was writing about something else entirely. Um, What I can say is that we were writing, this show took a long time to write, and we spent a lot of time writing it in lockdown, in COVID lockdown. Mm. So a sense of urgency we're both family people. We both have children. We're both parents. Um, and we also have older and we also have older parents ourselves. So we were very much thinking, and I certainly for it's thinking probably and rather selfishly for the first time, uh, thinking about consequence, thinking about, holy shit, everything that I thought too little about, I should be thinking a lot more about. So whether we were thinking or whether I was thinking particularly about the urgency of climate change, 
I was certainly thinking about how lucky we've had it and how it doesn't feel like that mm. anymore. Mm. Doesn't feel like it because you can see it accelerating so rapidly. Yes. COVID was as, as much a, I believe, a climate issue as it was a, a health issue. And I, you can't divorce the two. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I wish I could say that I had been a, a more of a strident environmentalist in the past 54 years of my life. It's not simply not true. I haven't been. What I did get was a kick in the ass. Um, a kick in the ass of, wait, holy shit, I need to start thinking about what's at stake. I think that COVID, if you weren't already facing the existential threat of what is the future of our species on this planet um, before COVID, COVID certainly, uh, I think, accelerated that and put it into high gear. And it was, for me, exacerbated by the fact that we spent our time actually between Northern and Southern California. And a couple of years ago, the fires in Southern California started increasing. But in Northern California, where we live in a very rural area surrounded by a lot of trees, um, when, we, when we bought our place in 2011, there was the occasional fire threat. By the time COVID hit, we had to evacuate twice because of fire. Mm. And that really brought into stark, horrifying relief how much things have changed. Um, the water started going away. The 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 you know the the dryness was so extreme, and I think that you know <laughs> it's it, it seems insane to me that it would be something to deny at this point, and it's particularly hard to stomach because I've I've actually seen it literally happen in my backyard, right? Um, you know, with a fire that came inches from my house, um, and that wasn't happening ten years ago. It just wasn't. So, and now it's happening three times a year. So the reality is that you, like, what you don't want to do is, is make a show where people feel they have to eat their vegetables all the time. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and that was really important for us. We didn't, it, it, the, nobody wants to have the, a finger wagged at them all the time. It's just right. not, it's just not entertaining and it's not fun. It's certainly not why people escape to go to television. However, I think that what Jenny and I really do believe is that you can entertain people greatly while also stealth bombing messages into your storytelling that make them think a little bit more about their place in the world, you know, and in the case of man who felt to earth, their place in the universe and, you know, how earth fits into that. And I think one of the things that Chiwetel and I spoke about a lot is that as we were developing the, the background of Anthea, you know, like what happened on that planet, Jenny and I were very, I think, deliberately vague, you know, we make a reference mm -hmm. in the pilot where we say, um, uh, the the, the, the there's a caste system on Anthea and the adepts who are the kind of seniors and the drones who are the the worker bees, Faraday who starts as a drone and then evolves from there, says the adepts miscalculated energy and we kind of leave it at that we don't we don't say a whole lot more about it but really what he's what he's saying metaphorically is that the people who were responsible for making choices about how we were going to be living on this planet and what we were going to be doing to this planet miscalculated and and suddenly it happened very very fast you know it was very very slow and then all of a sudden mm -hmm. which, which i think is in some ways my biggest fear because the simple truth is that people don't fully embrace the reality or accept what they have to do about it until it is right in front of them until the fire is literally in your backyard so like Jenny, I, you know, I, I wish that I had spent much more of my life um, crusading for the planet. And it, it really wasn't until the last 10 years that it became something that we realized we had to do. So I guess this is the long answer that I said was going to be the short answer, but now it's the long answer. That <laughs> our, our, uh, answer. Our, I think our attempt to sort of bring some awareness to this issue is, you know, is part of what motivated us to make this, uh, among many things, is part of what motivated us to make the show. And the fact that it's landing right now, I mean, I, I had a flash and also look, Alex and I, we laugh a lot and probably 80% 
we're very good friends and 80% of our relationship is laughing at wacky shit and then sending dog videos back and forth <laughs> or like for real, for real, or memes about cats that are significantly overweight. Like that, <laughs> Alex Kurtzman, Titan of Industry, yeah. will send you like a fat cat meme. That's what you're really up to. Yeah, yeah. Forget the Star Trek franchise and the Showtime. It's, it's, it's all like, you know, stuff no, on the Ukrainian it's all, fat cat. Yeah. Yeah. It's, all, um, it's all cat memes. But the other 20% of our relationship is deep paranoia, oh. which is so <laughs> much fun. Paranoia, panic, and and I was thinking about in the realm of paranoia and panic, which is always super fun to have dinnertime conversation, especially at the Kurtzman or Lumet households. Mm-hmm. Um, I was thinking about, I was, I remember, uh, I remember Three Mile Island and I remember China Syndrome. Oh yeah. Right. And that was a really entertaining movie that was personal and fun and had movie stars in it and was actually an action movie and it was a thriller and a horror movie and at the same time had a of course a very intense message which just happened to be released at the same time as the three mile island nuclear accident and there was indeed even a line in that movie saying say an area the size of pennsylvania would be uninhabitable and i remember being in the audience for that movie at whatever age i was going oh um, so that timing was so ex- extraordinarily weird and happenstance. Um, I, not even I, and I believe that show business is pretty craven. My family has been in it for about a hundred years. Right. Don't think that like paramounts to <laughs> start having a nuclear accident and to, like fill seats in the theaters. Like, I don't think, you know, we're that craven, yeah. but, um, the timing of the show and is not uh, a lucky accident. I don't know if lucky is entirely the right word. I, it, I would call it an unfortunate, an, an unfortunate act of timing. I mean, <laughs> you know, it, it, you don't want to be writing about the zeitgeist, you know, when you hit the zeitgeist and the zeitgeist happens to be this, but it is just what happened. Yeah. One of the, one of the things that's also, you know, so striking about the show and, and kind of in this realm of you're not hitting people over the head with it, but there are these reminders of the theme is the visual landscape of the film. So, you know, Faraday, the alien character lands in this desert landscape um, where the scientist, uh, Justin, who he seeks out is living and kind of eking out an existence. And there are parts of it where it almost feels like post-apocalyptic and like she's living in this kind of abandoned junkyard slash amusement park kind of set up and it's a little bit disorienting in that regard and everything is very bleak and the alien character faraday is constantly needing to ingest water because we get the impression that like he is like consists largely of water or fluid and and he's like he's almost like dying of thirst all the time and that 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 kind of just underlying visual and sensory tension was really interesting and you know it wasn't like you know oh yes this is a climate change story but it was just reminding you of like God, these are fragile environments and these people are just profoundly affected by them. And it was it's just kind of always there uh, uh, running. And uh, I thought that was just a really good choice. Oh, well, thank you. I mean, honestly, I, I, I think that the origin of that choice really went to Nicholas Rogue. Um, you know, Rogue interpreted Walter Tevis's novel, and and I think one of the things that landed for and this is this is the movie The Man Who Fell to Earth with David Bowie that your show is based on. Yeah. Yes. Yes. What Rogue did in interpreting Tevis's novel was to I think what what struck us the most from from the film was the the incredible sense of visual loneliness that he was able to capture. There are these extraordinary shots of Bowie in these empty desert landscapes, and you know sometimes there'll be tighter shots, but more, more often you'll, you'll see him as a small figure in an endless expanse of desert. And the idea that this character is so lonely and that the, the world looks so lonely is powerful. You know, he, he chose to shoot the film in New Mexico, but then, and, and then he did the Anthea sequences in White Sands, New mm-hmm. Mexico, which is a very different look to it. Yeah. But what was great was that because he shot both of those things in one one basically one place you felt the connection between them and i I think that's something that we really wanted to do was uh echo the feeling of anthea you you needed to look at anthea and go god that that it feels frighteningly familiar 
right? You needed mm-hmm. to be able to make the leap and go, this is what our planet could look like if we keep going down this road. And, and the scenes in Anthea too, I mean, we see them in flashback where, you know, um, Faraday's remembering his family. Yeah. And when we see him on Earth, he looks like a human. When we see him on Anthea, he has a kind of almost a little bit more of like, like a reptilian kind of quality, to it, but it's still humanoid. But yeah. it's it's violent. You get the sense that something horrible has happened. Um, and what made me think of it, it struck um, images in my mind, too, uh, you know, of, of refugees, you know, and, and he is, in a sense, a climate refugee in addition to an immigrant. Right. Who's like landed here and he's escaped something awful. Uh, that that was that was pretty striking. I thought and effective in the way that it, it wasn't overplayed as you're seeing it in flashes, you know. Well, something that we've learned and something certainly we've learned by me sitting next to people at dinner and them getting up and leaving because I talk because they're just like, stop, stop. <laughs> is that, um, um, wagging your finger at folk yeah. is immediately is the way to get folk to sort of stop listening. Totally. Um, and between Alex directed the first four episodes and did an extraordinary job. And our DP, Tommy Maddox Upshaw, between the two of them um, created these incredibly beautiful, there are these extraordinarily beautiful paintings of their still lifes, their oils, except you look closely and perhaps the fruit is rotting or perhaps, oh, yeah. right. What, what am I thinking? I, there's a name for them. In, if my um, husband were here, he's the painter, he would tell me, but yes. It's not I mean, there's- like the Mori, but it's something like that. Um, and I always, Alex, between Alex and Tommy, they created this painterly, I mean, these are these are images that are unbelievably beautiful. And at the same time, the the flip side of them is, wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, and I think it's an extraordinary way to get a message across. And I also think it's what makes for really great fun television, which there are more things in the frame every time you look at it. Yeah. And the story that you're telling is, is very layered. I mean, when we, and this isn't giving anything away, but when we, when the story begins, we see Faraday at some point in the future where he is standing in an auditorium giving a talk. He's not, you can't tell if he's, it's like a TED talk environment, but he kind of has a CEO tech titan, maybe cult leader kind of air about him. And then we flash back to where he was. And so there's all of these just layers of story that are kind of also interlocking. And there's a whole separate storyline with the CIA, which is really interesting. And we'll see where that's going. But it's a pretty complex visual landscape, but also the story, it, it's, you, you've really got to stay with it. And it, it kind of, um, it, it's quite layered. I never saw the original film. I don't know how much your story departs from the original. It departs a, a, an enormous amount um, from both the novel and the film. I think we took some of the essential elements of the, of the novel and the film, and it, we're, we're a 45 year later sequel. Mm-hmm. Um, so the character of Thomas Newton, played by David Bowie in the film, is now played by Bill Nye. And, Who's terrific. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's terrific in every way you want him to be. He's yes. just, uh, aside from like, there are no bad takes ever. He's the most delightful human being uh, on the planet. I, I love here. I love knowing that. So thank you. Because he's one of my faves. It's just, he's just so phenomenal. And, um, and uh, you know, the, the idea that he, that Thomas Newton had come and uh, created a company that was in the in the novel and film was called World Enterprises, and then the CIA came in and took it over and sort of uh, destroyed him and blind left him blind, literally blind and and penniless. All of that is it was jumping off point. It was backstory for us. So if you've seen or read either of those objects, then the story is richer. If you haven't, it doesn't matter because you'll learn it as you go over the course of our series, and we don't rely too heavily on it because we really wanted to tell our own story. And were you guys fans of the original? I mean, what, what led you to this story? Was it, was it the original Bowie movie or the novel? Yeah. I mean, it's a very unique film. You know, it's a, it, it, it's like the definition of a cult film. I, I'm a right. crazy huge Nicholas Rogue fan. I just think he's phenomenal. And, you know, he, one of the things I love most about Rogue is, is how elliptical his storytelling is and how, how cinematically he plays around with structure so much. He'll like, you know, he'll he'll tell a story in different timelines and 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 yet it's often 
uh, tied to a character's emotional subjectivity about how they felt about something then and how they feel about it now. I, f- I just found it very immersive. I think he was one of the first filmmakers when I started really falling deeply in love with filmmakers to teach me about what it meant to tell a story elliptically. Well, he also has whimsy. I mean, you know, Buck Henry la- launches a spit bubble off the edge of his tongue um, for absolutely no reason uh, <laughs> in the, like the first 20 minutes of that movie. And you're kind of like, I'm sorry, wait, did that just happen? Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's, it's just odd. There's just, there's so much oddness in the film, you know, yeah. like it's, it's, it's a very strange film. And I think one of the things that is so interesting about it is there are sections in it where it's almost like he took the pieces of narrative that would make it make more linear sense and just cut them out. Mm. Oh, interesting. And, and sort of left the audience in the way that only 70s directors were allowed to do <laughs> to yes. kind of go like, all right, I'm going to uh... interpret. I'm going to interpret here. I'm going to make the audience do their own interpretation, which, you know, is a, it's an amazing thing. We, we're not often allowed to do that much these days, but it's a, uh, it's an amazing thing to watch. Um, I want to talk about the cast because, I mean, you have just some really tremendous actors in here. And in your two leads in Chuyatel Ejiofor and Naomi Harris, two actors who are known for for dramatic work. Um, and I don't think I've ever seen Chuyatel Ejiofor do science fiction. Most people will know him probably from many movies, but probably most famously from 12 Years a Slave. Um, his physicality in this role I mean, it's remarkable. He starts out and he is, I mean, the way he moves, the kind of like halting nature of it, the way his voice, when he falls to earth, he doesn't really fully understand English and he's mimicking almost like a parrot what he's hearing and he's quickly learning it. But it's almost kind of guttural in the beginning and his movements are almost, to me, they almost struck me as a little bit reptilian in a way. Mm -hmm. Um, Talk talk a little bit about the physicality he brought to this because it, it evolves like, in every episode, you see him becoming a little more human, and it's it's really an extraordinary performance. You know, what's, ex- what's kind of amazing, there are a couple of, well, there are many, many amazing things about Chiotel, um Edgy Four. One thing that when we first, this when Sarah Timberman first brought The Man Who Fell to Earth to us, so we there's a lot of stuff we didn't know, but there were a couple of things we absolutely knew. And one of the things we both, Alec, Alec, both Alex and I absolutely knew was we both kind of looked at each other and said, Buster Keaton. Buster oh. Keaton. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, because if anybody <sighs> is completely about, anybody is fully embodies the human condition all the time without saying a word, yep. it's Buster Keaton. Right. I was speaking about Chiwetel the other day, and I said, Chiwetel could probably tell you the calibration of humanity in this character um, with the specificity that a musician can tell you what note he is playing when he looks at he or she is playing when they look at a score. Mm. Um, it's that, I believe he's that finely sliced mm-hmm. in this performance. Um, if that makes any sense. It does. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I was certain I was on set and I had the great pleasure of watching, but Alex was in there directing him and, um, Alex, you know, please share because <laughs> pretty, pretty ext- not everybody gets to direct you until a G4 and now we have Bill Nye and um, Clark Peters and Jimmy Simpson and Kate Mulgrew. And Kate Mulgrew, yeah. Yes, and and uh, and Zoe Wanamaker and Julia Stevenson. So please knock yourself out. <laughs> <laughs> um, happily, happily. I'll, I'll actually come, I'll come full circle to the, to the Buster Keaton. So just remind me to do that. Okay. But, um, so there, there's nothing quite like directing this this cast. I mean, uh, every actor to a person brought their whole self to it, and and just submitted to a process of dedication and focus and unearthing and unpacking things about every aspect of the character that was so phenomenal. Um, the thing about Chuatel is that we we actually have a very sim- similar and very rigorous process in that we we're we're both, we, we, I think I would say we were, we approach the work intellectually on the page, but then when we're on the floor, uh, you know, when you're shooting, you have to be viscerally and immediately in the moment to find the magic. Mm. And 
It's a, it's a real discipline. So there were a bunch of different things. The first thing that Chiwetel did, as all great actors do, is ask the right question. And the question that he asked was, what, how did I move on Anthea? Because I, I won't know how I moved here until I know how I moved there. Uh, and, and that led us to, uh, you know, obviously there's, the gr- gravity is different on his planet. It's heavier here for him. So he will, his, his learning to carry the gravity and uh, on his body um, is a very, was a very specific journey. There was a, a, there's a woman named Coral Messam who also plays Faraday's wife, who Chiwetel had actually been in a play with in London. And Coral is a brilliant choreographer and she choreographed Steve uh, McQueen's uh, small acts episode, Lover's Rock, which was mm. phenomenal. And I, I just thought Lover, Lover's Rock was like a, a totally transcendent experience, a, a meditative and transcendent experience, just to sort of a, a filmmaker who, who kind of went in there and said, I'm going to just sort of in real time, take you into the physicality of what's happening inside this house with these bodies moving together and dancing together. And it was, it was really something. And, um, Carl, I, I, I reached out to Carl. She was totally game. And what, what began was a series of physical exercises wherein we would talk about, what was happening on the planet Anthea. And we were talking about how that would affect Faraday on earth. And then they went off. I mean, I said, you know, as I, as I think it was my job, I said, listen, I can tell you what I am looking for. I cannot tell you how to achieve it. I am not a choreographer, nor am I a dancer. So you will have to figure that out. So we talked and then they went away and they would go to Hyde park and set up a video camera for them. just a little iPhone and, and do these different exercises. And, what sort of emerged was this idea that the volume of the planet was so loud, it got so loud because of the climate change, the storms, and that they could no longer hear each other when they opened their mouths. Mm. So over time, they have, they evolved into a sign language, a kind of Anthean sign language, where wherein they could communicate across distances. But they also had this sort of intuitive connection to each other that was almost animalistic and instinctual when it came to reactions. So imagine that you have eyes on the front of your head, the side, the back, and the other side. So they came to this idea that like, imagine two Antheans walking forward together in parallel, and they hear a noise off to their right. They would both stop. Now, a human being would stop and turn and turn their head to the right. They'd both stop, and then they'd both turn to the right at the same time. Mm. And it was a really interesting kind of thing to watch them. And they would send me these videos and I would comment on it. And, and the physicality of all we would, there was this church basement that we did a lot of rehearsal in and the scene where Faraday comes out of the ground for the first time and stands upright. We did a whole exercise on, on just the physicality of that. We also worked with an um, incredible woman named Kim Gillingham who um, would break down the text, we would break down the text every weekend, no matter how much we were working during the day, we would meet on Saturdays and Sundays, and we would, we would go into the week ahead, and we'd break down the text with Kim. And, you know, Jenny and I had been writing this thing for three years, and and Kim would make me see things that I didn't even realize were there. Wow. Yeah, it was like, I would introduce Kim to the other actors. And before I knew it, five of the actors were seeing her regularly. And they were working on everything from vocal quality to physicality. She was a huge, huge, huge part of it, um, and it, it be, what, what was wonderful and what made me so happy is that I, I, I'm always jealous. Like when I think about Orson Welles and 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 his um, the radio troupe that he had, right? The cast mm-hmm. of actors who he would carry from movie to movie to movie or show to show, and I love the idea of an ensemble, which is obviously originated in you know it, it has its roots in England. Um, and so we became kind of this interesting ensemble where we had not, it wasn't just the actors, but it was a choreographer and it was a, you know, it was Kim and, and we just got to do these, these amazing things together. And, and, and so it was a process. It was a, it was a long process. Now the, the, the long way around to Buster Keaton is that Keaton was known as the great stone face and he would do these things that the, the human body shouldn't physically be able to do. And he would do them, you know grab onto the side of a car as it raced past and, and allow the car to literally lift his body sideways off the ground and out of frame. Hmm. Things that just, things that just actually felt like you could only do it if you were a cartoon character. 
you know, right. but he would do all of that with, with the most stoic expression in the world. So we talked about that. And I think there's definitely some of that in Chiotel's performance. And then um, we wrapped, we finished and um, I'm looking online and I find this cache of uh, photographs from the man who fell to earth taken by the photographer who just passed recently, Steve, Oh, I can't remember his name. I'm so sorry. But he he was the set photographer for The Man Who Fell to Earth, for Taxi Driver, for The Godfather. Um, oh, wow. An extraordinary, extraordinary photographer. And he took all these beautiful, intimate portraits of um, Bowie on the set. And one of them is Bowie in his trailer, holding up to his face Buster Keaton's autobiography and making the same face that Keaton is making. <laughs> and I saw that. I love it. And so, and I, I bought it instantly because somehow osmotically, whatever was going on there translated to Bowie's performance, which somehow translated, even though it was not never stated, somehow translated to our interpretation of Bowie's performance and now into Chiwetel's performance. So it all really does come back around to Buster Keaton. I love that. And, you know, there's, there's another kind of quality of, you know, capturing kind of just every man qualities, basic humanity, Naomi Harris's character, and folks will know her from Moonlight and also from some of the recent Bond films where she plays Money Penny, and she's just in a really great body of work. Um, she is a working single parent. She's raising a daughter by herself. She's taking care of an ill father who needs medicine that she can't afford. I mean, she's really illustrative of just so many people who are just trying to keep it together, right? And on top of this, she's had to she's given up her career as a scientist for reasons that are becoming clearer as the story goes on. But, you know, she stands in it seems to me for a lot of people, you know, single parents, people who, you know, maybe had a kind of a thwarted ambition. Life has just become a huge burden. And I mean, you even see it in her physicality. She's just like constantly, it's like she's lugging something around all the time. Yep. She feels well, heavy. I, I think it was a, a journalist from the Washington Post who said that, you know, the hero's journey for uh, women of color uh, starts when they open their eyes in the morning, <laughs> yeah. um, which I think is absolutely right. Um we, we we made this, but the fact that this is about a black family, um, and yet it is never textualized right. that this is about a black family was a huge a huge part of uh, the thinking going into this. Um, and when in earlier when we were talking, I said sometimes you don't know what you're writing about until weeks later, years, months later, even years later, and. I realize, and this may sound dumb, people may say, oh, but doesn't that make sense that that would live at the front of your brain? Sure, but human beings usually like to keep the really important stuff tucked way, way, way in the card catalog and the way back recesses of their brain where they can't access it. And the trivial shit's usually right up there in the front. So I'm a single mom. My mother was a single mother for a long time. Her mother was a single mother and her mother was a single mother. So this is going back to the reconstruction of the United States of America. <laughs> um, there was a certain, for me, a thank you to single mothers and sing of course, single parents, but there certainly was a, a thank you for She's heavy because she's moving the the earth along. She's moving the planet along. She's moving her, her family along. Um, and she had something that she has to think about all the time. And if what's interesting about what I really appreciate about this show is that to both Faraday and to, but certainly to the character of Justin, the world is quite hostile to them in the pilot. Um, and, but you never, again, we don't comment on it. We don't say this is a hostile world. The environment, the landscape is hostile. Um, the folk that Justin is working with are hostile. Uh, she has to put on a mask. She has to put on a hazmat suit. Um, she has to, for the, you know, to keep her father in a state of relative comfort, she has to go outside the law, not because she's a criminal, but because she's because the system that's been set up is, is hostile to her. I think it's indicative. I think it's indicative of what 
the, the amount of negotiation simply to get up in the morning and then close your eyes at the end of the day that so many folk go through. There's a line in there, which is a line that I love, um, which is that hope is really expensive. Mm. And I think that, um, I, I think at some point you say, this is a little bit painful for me. So I'm going to do what I need to do and put, maybe I'll put my stuff on the shelf. And, uh, when my kid grows up, maybe my kid will be able to feel hopeful. Um, and Justin to me is, uh, traveling the same distance as Faraday. Mm -hmm. Um, how far is it to return to a hopeful place within yourself? Is it the same as the distance between two planets? And I can, I'll say, yeah. And I love the scene between them when, and it's the same scene where he tells her that basically you have eight years left on this planet as you know it. And she makes a deal with him. And I love that you said it's like it, it, every day is about negotiations because for yeah. her, for Justin, it is like the, all, just every day she's making choices and negotiations and it's wearying and it's, it's, it, it causes, I mean, it made me anxious for her, but she, he, she says to him, like, basically I will help you if you agree to give us the technology once we build it to save our planet. And he says, I'll help you do that. If you agree from now on, you're a scientist again. Mm -hmm. And she has to basically make this choice to, upend her life and risk everything. Uh, but she knows it's the right thing to do because, you know, he's demonstrated to her like you were on the cusp of dis discovering something great. And I love that, like, he just raises the stakes for her in that moment, like as basically as far as they can go. And it, and it feels completely natural to their relationship. It does. But I'm going to I will make the argument um, that is an, it's incredibly dangerous to be a brilliant woman. It's incredibly dangerous. You perceive an enormous amount of hatred and vitriol. Mm. Um, you really do. And it's it, it's uh, incredibly dangerous to be a brilliant uh, woman of color, even more so. And this is where sort of people go, you know, shut up, stop talking and come on and give us a break. And um, except for the fact that it's that it's true mm -hmm. to, to sort of to announce to the world that you are here on this planet, to a planet that doesn't really want to see you, um, immediately makes you and your, belo your beloved uh, targets. Um, so what she said, she is certainly in an emotional bunker um, until Faraday arrives there. And well, you could make the argument that the safest thing for her would be to stay in the emotional bunker because the world is a very, very dangerous place. So my, I have a deep, deep girl crush on Justin, man, because she is far braver. She is far braver and she doesn't say, you can take it, um, but if you're gonna save your planet, you're gonna take me with you. She says, take it and I'm gonna see if I can get eight, however many, 12 billion people, I'm gonna see if I can get 12 billion people a fighting chance, um, which is a pretty, pretty her thing to do. Not everybody would make that particular bargain. There's a million things that Justin doesn't do. And I'm fascinated by all the things that she doesn't do. And it's hearing you explain that too. something that <clears throat> now I'm realizing, I didn't realize this in watching her performance, but you see it in the choices that Naomi Harris makes that character is hiding the fact that she's a genius. It's almost, yes. she's, she's hiding it away like it's a dangerous thing if anybody found out what her previous life was, mm -hmm. where she was on the verge of some world altering discovery that it would like, it, like it would get her in a lot of trouble. And it's just, it's a very, and you see how anxious she becomes when, you know, Faraday points out like, no, I know all about your background and your thesis yeah. paper. And she's looking at him like, Jesus, don't talk about that. Don't talk about it. I mean, look, an analogy that, that I think travels or that works very well is the analogy of Jackie Robinson. Mm. Jackie Robinson uh, uh, was brilliant. And he then he became a celebrated famous person and everybody and their mother tried to kill him. So there is certainly something to declaring your genius and declaring your passion that's, that's uh, uh, fraught. And it's not quite the world does not necessarily reach out and say, oh, I'm so glad you decided to show up. <laughs> that's, that's not, <laughs> as I think, as we all know, that is not the way it works. Right, right. Um, I want to, I'd love to talk about your backgrounds and how you guys all got into this crazy business. Um, Alex, maybe maybe you talk. What? How did you uh, uh, become a writer? How did you break into filmmaking? 
Um, I always knew that I wanted to be a writer and I always saw writing as, as being a path to directing, but I think, I don't know, it's sort of a chicken or egg thing. I started by sort of getting any job that I could get that would get me in the door of the industry. And then I ended up working as a, an assistant to a producer on Hercules and Xena, which were syndicated shows in the tele in, in the nineties. Mm-hmm. And it, the, they were incredibly powerful experiences for me because um, I think I, I kind of everything I ever learned about what it means to write for genre, I learned watching those, watching the writers do those shows. And the writers were very kind to me and um, mentored me and, and let me um, write a script for them. Um, and they liked it and then they let me write another one. And then through a confluence of miracles, I and my former partner were the sh- were the showrunners of uh, Hercules and then Xena at like twenty three years old. Oh my god! At twenty three, you took over the shows. Yeah, it was it was wow. very it was a very strange set of circumstances that sort of the tumblers fell into place for that. And did you did you worry like oh god they're going to find out I don't know what I'm doing? <laughs> you know, I still worry that every day. <laughs> <laughs> but what was amazing was that syndicated television at the time everybody looked their, down their nose at it. Right? right, this is well before streaming and cable. Right. You know, I think H, obviously HBO existed, but it was it certainly wasn't what HBO is now. And, you know, you'd go to a party and people would ask you what you do. And you're like, I work on this syndicated television show. And they'd sort of turn away and start talking to somebody else. <laughs> and now it's Game of Thrones. Yep. You know, now now genre is television on every level. And but what I learned was, no, even if people don't, even if even if people perceive it as campy, you have to write it seriously. Mm-hmm. You have to take it seriously. Um, because if you don't take it seriously, you can't expect the audience to either. And and those shows walked a very unique tone, um, and they were diff- very different shows, but they walked a very unique tone. And I loved working on them. And I, I I'm I'm so grateful to um, Rob Tappert and Sam Raimi who gave me my first job and sort of that trust. Mm. And then, w- whereas everybody else was like, "You only worked on Hercules and Xena. We're not interested in hiring you." JJ Abrams was like, "Oh my God, you worked on Xena? Let's do Alias together." So, nice. <laughs> so that was sort of my launching point. And then um, the films I started making from there and, and the, the, the different television shows were, were that, that was how it all began for me. And did you always want to do science fiction? I mean, I'll be honest with you. I, I for my entire adolescence, I, I thought I was going to be making movies like sex lies and videotape. Oh, interesting. Um, it was, I, I loved science as a kid. I, I couldn't have loved Spielberg more and I still do. And in fact, when I'm directing, I'll watch, I'll try and watch at least one movie a day, sometimes two. Um, and, and because it's very interesting. Something happens to your vision when you're directing and you watch other people's movies. You see things very differently than you do when you're just sitting, you know, at home or in a theater watching. You, you're, you're suddenly hyper aware of the choices that are being made. Mm-hmm. And um, every time I direct, I end up going back to Spielberg always. Uh, just it's just where my heart is, and and I and I think it's because he's such a magician. He's such an extraordinary magician. He, the the level of complexity to what he's doing directorially, um, you know, is is so profound and yet so invisible most of the time. Yeah, you know, a shot will start, and he will focus your eye on exactly what he wants you to pay attention to because that's where the story is. And then the camera will move to the next thing and it will go from a small object and suddenly you're in a wide shot and you're seeing 50,000 people happening. And still he's directing your eye to exactly where he wants it to go. And then it goes back into something small. And the minute that shot ends, it's because that particular story point is over. And the next shot that picks up is starting all over again, always from a place of story, always, always, always. Mm -hmm. And so there was, there's just something about that kind of narrative I, the sort of single camera, every shot matters because every shot is, what does it make me feel? And, and what, and what is it telling me about the story? Um, really just influenced me hugely, I think on man. And, um, I mean, I think I always kind of knew that, that, that was what I wanted to do, but I, for for part of why I, my partnership with Jenny is so meaningful to me, other than all the things that she described, which is that we have so much fun together is that I, I saw Rachel getting married in the theater. And when I saw it, it, 
something activated in me, like, like a tuning fork was hit. And I thought there were a lot of stars in that movie. But for me, the biggest star was the writer who wrote it because that person is my family. Like I know, I know them already. And it was a very profound feeling. And I called Jenny's agent and was like, I know she doesn't know me, but maybe she wants to sit down and we'll meet. And we sat down and we hit it off. And I think that part of what I love about our writing relationship is that we, I can always anchor back to like, where's the Rachel getting married version of this scene. Mm-hmm. You, no matter how big it is, it always needs to be small and intimate and poetic and unexpected. And, you know, science fiction is, is a, it's a wonderful canvas to paint on, but it doesn't mean anything unless it's intimate and small. And so no matter the trick is no matter how big it is, no matter how big your canvas is, it always has the audience is never, it's very hard to impress audiences with visuals anymore Mm -hmm. because you can Mm -hmm. see anything. Right. And, and you know, you, but if you can do that, and anchor them into a small human detail that makes you go, that's that's me up there. I, that's how I would react. Then I think you have something really special. Jenny, Alex mentioned Rachel getting married, the film mm-hmm. uh, that, that you wrote starring uh, mm-hmm. Anne Hathaway. Um, how did you get into this business? Did you grow up wanting to be a writer as well? <laughs> uh, well, remember when I was telling the stories of um, all the single mothers? Uh-huh. Okay, so... Uh, my grandma's mother, Edna Scotton, mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. was in the tent shows in the Deep South. Mm. Um, and again, this is the time of Reconstruction. So, and that's on my mom's side. On my dad's side, um, his, my dad, the director, Sidney Lamat, his father, um, Baruch, uh, was a performer in the Yiddish theater and also an actor in... Uh, Poland, where he was from, there's a big, there's a big um, gap uh, uh, because of the Nazis in that side of the family history. Um, but for real, for real, uh, I found a Wikipedia page uh, with uh, my father's family going back to the 15th century. Uh, oh, wow. uh, yeah, I know. A, uh, oh, I'm looking at your grandfather's Wikipedia page right now. But yeah. Oh, Baruch? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, he belonged to a family on one side called Abarbanel, which was um, uh, a, philo- a Jewish philosopher living in Portugal in the 15th century who wrote treaties that still are taught. Um, and he wrote poems and poetry mm-hmm. uh, and treaties on love um, that are actually taught in certain uh, yeshivas today. So since the beginning of time, nobody's had a steady job on either side of my family. Um, I never thought about doing anything else, but it would have, I mean, I'm sure my parents would have loved it if I had gone to law school, but it never, it never, <laughs> I, 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 it never occurred Well, they to couldn't me. really demand it since they were in the business, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's no, there's no, this is what we've been doing since the beginning of time. Yeah. And, um, um, that's so there was no not in it and in that and growing up it's not about oh you grow up on a set in the back of a fancy car it's not like that that didn't happen my dad would go to work at six in the morning and we'd all have dinner together at 6 30 every single night Mm because that's how he directed um but it was about the people who we were around um the people who were in the house it was all actors and musicians and composers and dancers. And that's uh, the dishwasher scene in Rachel Getting Married is based on a dinner that it was most based on this time after dinner when Bob Fosse was in our house. And um, he and my dad got in, they kind of like, it was the end of dinner and look, Bob Fosse, Bob Fosse looks like that. Mm-hmm. Like he was in these black cashmere pants and is wearing this black cashmere polo and had a black cashmere sweater over his black cashmere polo. He was smoking and his cigarette smoke, Bob Fosse's cigarette smoke looks like Bob Fosse's cigarette smoke. Does that make any sense? Oh, sure. Yeah. Very elegant freaking guy. And my papa, who I love more than anything else, um, looks like a cantaloupe. And he was (laughs) in a, (laughs) he was in a tracksuit that he had gotten like in a gift bag it had all this vinaigrette on the tummy part because he had this big tummy and he was always getting salad dressing on stuff 
<laughs> but anyway, and he's also five five. So there's Bob Fosse being all lean and elegant in the kitchen. And there's my dad being five five in his sweatsuit, probably from that was indeed from a gift bag. And dad's loading the dishwasher. And Bob Fosse takes a drag of a cigarette and says, You know, Sydney, if you put the salad bowls on the side, you can get about 20% more content in the dishwasher. <laughs> right? And my dad, who's quite the master of the dead pan, said, oh, yeah, well, go fuck yourself, Bob. And the two of them were actually, they were both vets. They were both in the World War II together. Uh -huh. um, not uh, Bob Fosse was in the Navy. My dad was in the Army. But um, so there's a certain macho, like, duking it out shit that these two guys always had. But then there I was at the age of 10 watching Bob Fosse and my dad load and unload our dishwasher in East Hampton, which is weird. Like it's yeah. just <laughs> so. Um, that, scene became, that became the scene in the movie. That of, became the scene of, in yeah. that became the scene in in Rachel getting married and um, the folk that I grew up around. And look, the extraordinary Comden and Green, um, whose children are still friends, and it was a it was a. A war, I don't think it necessarily exists in the same way. Um, mm -hmm. This very East Coast, uh, I'm going to use very optimistically the word bunch of artists. Yeah. They, they never would say that about themselves. They were like, oh, who's working? Who's working? I don't know. Wow. Is it me? Is it you? Um, but it was about, it was a house of expression and everybody did a lot of yelling. And there was all people, always people leaping up from their uh, chairs to say a thing or do a thing or tell you about a thing. Um, so to work in a job and it's been a real adjustment. I'm always incredibly grateful that Alex uh, and I are partners and that Alex reached out. Um, there's another thing that I deeply appreciate about Alex, which is that I wrote Rachel getting married and it was very, very hard for me to sell another screenplay after that, even though the movie was a great hit and a great success and a critical success the next two screenplays that I had, I had written and indeed had already written, uh, the, the lead characters were, were people of color and I just couldn't mm. get the movies made. And uh, so I spent a couple of years doctoring scripts and learning shit and, you know, taking meetings and stuff. And when Alex reached out to me, Alex was making television that had black people in it. He was making Sleepy Hollow and he was starting Discovery. And I thought, wow, this guy, uh, this guy is uh, really doing something that people, and it was good. It wasn't trauma based. It wasn't, it wasn't some kind of, uh, it wasn't that strange trauma based trauma porn weirdness. I was just so, and I probably gave him, and I constantly tell him, you were like this khaki wearing nerd and you're very lucky that I even glanced your way a second time, <laughs> but I, which he was, but, and he is, but at the same time, I'm incredibly grateful because here was this guy taking what was an extraordinary risk of putting black people at the front and center of his show. Like what the hell his shows, what the, who, nobody was doing that eight, 10 years ago. Yeah. Well, I take that back. People, some people were doing that. Alex was one of them. And I'm, you know, I'm like, I've, once I'm in, I'm in. And I was like, yeah, Alice Kirsten is a good guy. And that's all I'm going to fucking say, because now he's going to, and I'm never going to hear the end of it. I'm never going to hear the end of this now. So, so you guys seem to have the the rare functional Hollywood uh, uh, creative relationship. Where you think the, yeah. two, the, two, the two good people found each other. <laughs> <over here. laughs> um, he's extraordinarily calm, which is something that I appreciate about Alex. And I tend to go into a, uh, uh, Yosemite Sam mode. Well, one thing I am curious about, and since instance, Jenny, you brought up your dad, who is I mean, really one of the great American film directors of the 20th century. I mean, Alex, I have to ask, is this like when you seek out the writer of this movie that you loved and you want to talk to her, is it, I mean, do you see, are you thinking like, is she like a filmmaker, like her father is the same? Are you imagining like this world that she grows up in? I'm, I'm just curious if it was, I mean, if I was seeking out, I would say Sidney Lumet's daughter, I might be a little intimidated, but I don't know how it was like for you. And you know, it's so funny and all the time that I've, I've known Jenny, I, I never stopped to think about what you just asked me. Huh? That's so, that's so weird. Well, that's I, weird. I, uh, yeah. 
I should have, I guess, but I no, I didn't. I, I never really. It's like I knew it, but I I didn't connect the dots enough to make it something that felt like oh, you really shouldn't do that, you know? Because um, I did not. I my my background and my family it was nothing like nothing like Jenny's, right. and um, I mean, actually, weirdly, very like Jenny's in many ways, but, but my dad was a, is a dentist and my mom was a sociologist. And so just a very different background, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I think that Jenny and her father are both extreme humanists mm. and they, they, their stories focus first and foremost on the micro nuances of human behavior. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is, not only precious, but part of, as it's sort of back to the thing I was saying about science fiction. I think in big, you know, loud, either feature storytelling or in, you know, big mainstream television storytelling, although much, much less so now. I mean, we are, you know, everyone talks about the golden age of streaming and it's just, it's just the naked truth. I mean, the, the, the stuff that you, that we have access to on television now is some of the best writing I think I've ever seen, mm. you know, in media ever. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and I, and I can tell you the, the names of the writers that deeply, deeply influenced my love of writing, you know, um, one of whom was Patty Chayefsky, who, who obviously wrote Network. Right. Can but, I just tell you that I had a Barbie dream house and Patty Chayefsky was there and I was like, do you want to play? Oh. And he was like, no. <laughs> what do you mean, no? <laughs> Did Barbie scream out the window? I'm mad as hell. I'm not going to take it anymore. <laughs> yes, she did. Barbie's Good. had it with all this patriarchal general. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you could do a remake, actually. Actually, you don't even need to do a remake of Network because I feel like I watch Network and I'm like, was this filmed yesterday? No, I know. No, you, it's you, insane. You can't. You, you can't. You can't do a remake of Network. It's perfection. It would be, it's like trying to do a remake of Jaws or Back to the Future. Yeah, like, it, don't, don't but do it's, it. like, it's like, it's timeless. I, I can't tell if it was predicting the future or I'm like, well, was the media landscape really that then? Because it, you oh, look at it and you're like, no, yeah. we're living in Network today. Like, yeah, <laughs> it, I mean, it, it was, it's, uh, it's always been what it is. Amazing. I mean, it's always been what it is. Um, Jenny, your grandmother was Lena Horne, yeah, um, uh, and who uh, a beloved entertainer, singer, yeah. but also an activist. And I'm curious, I mean, because we've talked a bit about like the kind of the themes of activism, but not hitting you over the head that are in Man that Man Who Fell to Earth, and it's it's first and foremost a story, but there are clearly all of these messages that you both want to get across. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm curious, I mean, like, both for both of you, I mean, growing up, were there you know, were, I mean, maybe it was your grandmother, Jenny, but people who kind of instilled that kind of spirit of, you know, you need to say something, not just tell a story. Did you guys have those influences growing up? I mean, I have, I did because with their, their, the nature of it was um, existing in your skin. Mm -hmm. You have to fight to, for the right to be able to simply do that. Yeah. Um, so that was, uh, and it's weird because I'm also, there's also this enormous privilege. So you have this, okay, I'm, we are a family who had to, on both sides, fight for the right to ex simply exist and walk down the street in our own skin. And at the same time, I we all, you know, I went to private school with my sister and we had this fancy house in East Hampton in Manhattan. So it's this funny, uh, it's a funny world. Um, but I'm actually, so, I mean, look, we were, there was no choice in my family, uh, but I'm actually much more interested in, Alex's answer because I've never asked him this question. I love it. You guys are getting to learn new things about each other. This is no, awesome. we are. All right. So, Alex. if I understand the question that you're asking is, what, was there somebody who like instilled in me a sense of, of politics? Yeah, or activism, or or, or, or that in your storytelling, it should not just merely be about entertaining and transporting, but trying to you know maybe teach somebody something or say something. Did you feel compelled to say something? Yes, I don't know that I I could articulate it with a single point of clarity. So I'll I'll do my best. I'll give you a couple answers if that's okay. Sure, please. So so starting early on, one of the things that I think my mother instilled in me, my my mom was a so is is was a sociologist, and when she was like she, um, when I was eight years old, we moved to Mexico, mm. and um, because she was doing work in Mexico and. She was one of the first people to work. So she she would she would do female population status 
in um, Mexico and in Los Angeles, and she was one of the first people to do work on the AIDS crisis and um, how it was affecting women of color. And um, and I at, at the time, it was not something that I would have been aware of. At, like, she didn't come home and preach to me about how important that was, and she didn't come home and tell me like, but I but I was aware that my mother dedicated her her life to representing women. Mm-hmm. That she was literally like, okay, well, no one else is tallying them, so I'm going to do that. And you know, it it was silent and mostly um, unacknowledged work. And I I feel like I remember her struggling quite a bit, just to get grant money to sort of go from research paper to research paper. But she did it, you know. So in that sense, without you know turning to me and saying, Alex, you must go out and tell stories that are significant. There's, you know, there's that. So, so my wife, Sam, um, and it's so funny. It's so funny what time does, but Sam was always really political and she was vocal about it and vocal about LGBTQ and vocal about people of color and vocal about, and what was all, it was just what she from high school on, you know? Um, and so she would take me to apartheid marches and she would take me to, and this, I've known her since we were 14 years old. So we were, my wife and I were best friends for 15 years before we got together. Now we've been married for 20 years. And, and I fo- I sort of followed these very powerful, strong women around. Um, and as a result, have always been much, much more com- comfortable in the company of women and the friendship of women than, than men for the most part. And, you know, I, I don't, it's not really for me to psychologize why exactly, you know, but that's just been what it is. And, um, and writing women is easier for me than writing men. Much, much easier, actually. I, I have a hard time hearing men. Jenny is extraordinarily good at writing men. Um, and so I, I will actually rely on her to be the Kickstarter of, of, a, of a voice um, and then once it's there, I can get into it and do it, but it's hard for me to generate it from, from its inception. Um, and funnily enough, like, you know, without getting too detailed, I, I, I made a lot of movies and some of them I think were really good and some of them were not. And, um, you get to a certain point in your career where you start to go, what am I saying? Like, what am I actually saying? What am I talking about? You know? And it, it, and by the way, if you're fortunate enough to get to the point where you've done enough things that you can ask that question, then, you know, I, again, God Jenny's acknowledging, you. Yeah. you know, her privilege. I'm definitely acknowledging mine. Like I was very, very fortunate. I worked really hard, but I was also very fortunate. And um, and I just got to a certain point where some of the things I was doing felt very empty. And discovery was a was a real turning point for me because. I was in uh, New York the year that it launched and Dr. Mae Jemison, I've told this story before, but Dr. Mae Jemison was our moderator at, um, at, at, on a panel. And we were backstage in the green room and she and I talked for like two hours. We were just waiting there for a long time. And she was unbelievable. First African-American woman in space. Hmm. And I asked her, God, an astronaut, why, how, you know, how, how did you get there? And she said, Uhura. I saw Star Trek, I saw Uhura, and I knew that I had to do that. Wow. And it hit me in that moment so profoundly the enormous responsibility of not of not just what it meant to do Star Trek and to to do Star Trek, but also to to tell stories that can make a young woman who feels invisible go, I'm gonna go do something impossible. Well, I think that you're hitting on something that, you know, this, this is this is the power of film. It's the power of movies is people can see themselves up there and imagine themselves as something that they're not. Um, and I think it's in, in, it's, you know, Jenny, going back to you raised the, the point at the beginning that, you know, you cast black actors in the show and the story doesn't require it. But that was clearly, you know, a choice that you all made. And, and I, I think it does add something to the story. I think it's, you know, you're seeing these characters. And as you said, it's never textually 
referenced. It doesn't need to be for the plot. Actually, no. We knew from, we always knew that Justin, the character of Justin, which was the first character we truly understood as the character of Faraday as a spaceman, uh-huh. um, we knew that she had to be a woman of color because okay. we needed a character with a genuine perspective on the planet. You can make the argument that, mm. that, people, that women of color are the most vulnerable species here on Earth. Yeah. And um, uh, and so that is the person that th- that is the perspective we needed to get an honest picture of the landscape. If, for example, and I may make many an enemy, but if our spaceman had come to where I grew up, had come to Manhattan and made friends with a mom with a kid in private school, a mom who had access to incredible health care, a mom who was never thing might not have ever been uh, uh, food insecure, a mom who knew who could make a plan six months out. Yeah. That's not a perspective that everybody on the planet is lucky to have. That's a perspective that a couple of people on the planet mm-hmm. have. So uh, you needed someone who understood the world honestly. And it, the character of Justin was always a woman of color. Mm. Um, could you make The Man Who Fell to Earth? Yeah, The Man Who Fell to Earth got made without people of color. It was an extraordinary movie and an extraordinary book. But the perspective, and it goes circling back to, if you want to talk about the cl- climate change and climate migration um, and the planet, who will climate change and climate migration affect first, hardest, and worst? Mm-hmm. It's not Ma- Manhattan mom. It's the Justins of the world. The other thing that Chiwetel often talks about, which which I think is such a powerful thing, is that when when you're talking about immigration and mm-hmm. migration, you know, there's this there's this ex- it's this extraordinarily negative um, spin that's often put on it, right? Like, oh, we have to keep them out, or they're going to come in and they're going to bring in the. But no one ever says, look at the incredible ways that immigration and people who come from different places expand our horizons and awareness of the world and art and science and humanity. I mean, that is the basis upon which we have evolved as a species. Mm -hmm. And it's so rarely spoken of as a positive. It's always spoken of as like, oh, that different person's coming in, you know? Without it, would we have had Steve Jobs? Right. There would be no, Steve Jobs is the son of immigrants. Syria, Syrian immigrants. And and that is an extraordinary thing that, you know, w- whether you like what he did or you didn't, nobody can deny that he literally changed the face of our planet. And that idea gets implanted in your story from the beginning, because <clears throat> before we really even understand who Faraday is, as I said, we see him in the, f- in the near future at some point in which he appears to have become some kind of global celebrity that is bringing that is advanced is advancing humanity in some way and part of the i guess the mystery of the plot is how does he do that but that idea is really embedded from the beginning isn't it that this immigrant who landed here did something profound and now we're going to tell you what it was absolutely and you know that it's a very self-conscious allusion to steve jobs and to the to the moment where he stepped out on stage and introduced the iphone which is one of the most kind of extraordinary moments i think really ever not just the turning point in media, but like what it, what it did to us as a species. And honestly, I'm, I'm undecided about how I feel about it. Yeah. I mean, I'm as addicted to my iPhone as anybody, Mm -hmm. but if you, if, if you told us, you know, 30 years ago that you could have a device that you press a button and it will tell you how the world feels about you specifically, I'm not sure I would have taken that bet. Right. You know? Right. Well, I'm going to ask you guys the traditional last question that we always ask on this show. Uh, you cannot, you can't actually see this, but I am holding in my hands a. It's an actual box. It's a very strange, magical-looking box called the Chatterbox. Ooh. And I'm going to, re- and we always reach in here and we ask our guest one question that's been pre-written and that I select at random. Ooh, uh, wow. And this is the first time we've actually ever had two people, two guests on the show at once. So I'm going to ask one to each of you. Okay. Um, and who wants to, who wants to go first? Because that'll make it even more random. You get to pick. Alex. All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Alex. Here's your question. I'll be the canary. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Uh, 
In what country other than your own would you most like to live and why? That's an appropriate Ooh. question on the subject of being an immigrant. Um, I've spent a lot of my life living in other countries with my parents hmm. um, and sort of to, to feel like an outsider in another place is an amazing gift actually as, an, as a life experience and fi- to sort of to figure out how to integrate into a in, into somewhere else when, when the language is not your native tongue and uh, is, is a really wonderful thing. Um, I would have given you a different answer 10 years ago hmm. um, because I think I would have been more city inclined. But if you ask me now, like I'm a, a more country inclined person. Um, so it would be somewhere in Europe, I think. Um, it might be England because England has z- just these incredibly pastoral countrysides. And then the city of London is one of my favorite cities in the world. It might also be France, where my parents lived for 30 years on and off, um, which is a, a very beautiful place that has a lot of a gorgeous country. Um, the truth is that as much as I've traveled, I feel like there's so much of the world I have not seen. Mm. So to, to really answer your question accurately, I think I have to do some more traveling. But if I had to make a decision tomorrow, I'd probably move to England as a base because it's also so close to Italy and France and so many other places. Yeah. And I lived there for a year. I've actually lived there for two years of my life. Um, once when I was making a film and once when I was doing man. So I, I just was there last year for a full year and, and just fell in love with it. I, I love London too. That's, that is my, that is my pick up stakes and go to another city place. If I had to pick yeah. one. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. Jenny, I'm reaching into the chatterbox for you. Here we go. Ah, this is a good one. <laughs> We don't always have TV people on them, but sometimes the TV people get the TV question. <laughs> um, tell us your favorite or least favorite spy or political thriller movie or TV show. So it could be political thriller or spy movie, favorite or least favorite, or mm. both. Oh, I, here's what I will say. Um, and this is not the, there's not the first movie that came to my mind, but, but the first movie that came to my mind was in no way a spy or political thriller by anybody's imagining, by anybody's yardstick. It was Blazing Saddles, which has nothing to do with anything <laughs> except for the fact that it's my favorite movie that was ever made in the history of movies. Really? Besides That's your favorite movie. I love yes. that. Yes. And, and, oh, and uh, Holy Grail. Yes. Money, oh, okay. and Holy Grail, those two Mel Brooks's. So okay. given <laughs> the limits of your question. I'm going to say the first two Born movies, I had the best freaking time. Okay. I love me some paranoid movie making. And those are some paranoid. Everybody in those movies is completely yeah. about to jump out of their skin. Totally. And when I watch that stuff, I relax. Like that's watching people <laughs> more paranoid than me is the only way I can feel better, man. I tried yoga like three times and I was like, they want me to close my eyes? Fuck them. I'm not closing my eyes around these yeah. people. I don't know these people. I don't know what they want. <laughs> so watching the Bourne movies, I was like, oh, this is like Thanksgiving. This is great. So your idea of chill is like to like throw on three days of the condor, like parallax view. Parallax just view, it. totally. And be like, this is what it is. Of course. It confirms my, you know, and confirms the essential worldview. Absolutely. I love it. I love it. I love it. But <laughs> By the way, movie trivia is making me realize an insight I have, which you probably already realize, is that you guys have two cast members from Love Actually in your show. We do. We do. We do indeed. Oh, yeah. No, believe that came up many times. Did it really? How, yeah. did, did, I'm curious because it, it's Chewy Atology for who plays the, the groom to Kira Knightley. And, of course, Bill yeah. Nighy is Uncle Bill. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. One of my just all-time favorites. God, favorite characters, and I quote, I quote his lines from that movie all the time. I'm just curious: Did Bill Nighy and Chewie tell you for like, did they work? Did they were they ever in a scene together in that movie? Do they remember working in that movie together? I don't think they were in a scene together, but they did a play together. Oh, wow. um, it was an Andrew Andrew Lincoln. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the three of them did a play together at a very formative moment in all of their careers. Oh, just wow. um, and they 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 were incredibly close. So Chiwetel and Bill were so excited to work together again. And, you know, my, my favorite moment in Love Actually, which has so many amazing moments, is the moment where Bill turns to his, I don't even know what you'd call it, really, like you know, um, his sort of companion, but not really his ma- His manager, effectively. His yeah. manager and says, it's you. Like, that moment yeah. is just fall on the floor unbelievable, you know? Yeah, it's and great. Also, it's also, it's... Um, Bill, they, they both wear their souls on their sleeves, mm. you know, and their hearts, like they wear everything on their sleeves. And um, there's a thing with Bill where like, 
his vulnerability in that moment after all this bluster and all, you know is so profound you know it's sort of like he just gets to this raw moment of truth where he's finally saying this thing that is is filled with like it's coming so late in his life and you know it's just oh god it's an incredible incredible moment i have I, to say that i never saw it oh you haven't seen it I gotta say though, I, I think you I think you should watch because it, it truly is one of the more divisive movies, I feel. Like okay. this movie has lovers and genuine haters. I am in the absolute lovers yeah. category. I can't make it past yeah. the fucking credits without crying at that movie. Oh my god, the credits are it, it's it's like forget it. It's game over on the credits. I'm a mess. It's I'm a mess oh, it's, the whole movie. It's, it's I mean I remember the first time I saw it, it was like someone just grabbed me by the throat all of a sudden. The only love movies that I really like are the ones where like there's a dog and it runs away and then it comes home. Oh, I, like <laughs> I know. Movies too. Or what was the movie that Dudley Moore like narrated? It was the dogs and the Oh cats. yeah, Milo and Otis. Yes. Milo and Otis, that's like, I'm going to cry buckets. That, was, that was my sister's like growing up. My sister watched Milo and Otis like, like every, yeah. every week. Now watch me get like a weird Twitter fan club of people who like to watch rom-coms <laughs> about animals. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. This could be your next show, you guys. Yeah. I'm sensing it. <laughs> I'm se- <laughs> something's coming together. I'm like, you know, it's going to be like, you know, dogs and on another planet. And who knows? <laughs> I love it. Uh, well, Jenny Lamette and Alex Hertzman, it has been a delight talking to you. Thanks for hanging out with us. Um, congratulations on the show. It is uh, The Man Who Fell to Earth. It's on Showtime now. People can watch it. It is, it's got a lot of big themes and it's just, it's a, it's a very compelling story and it will keep you guessing. Trust me. It is, uh, it is good TV. So congratulations to you both and thanks for coming on. Thank you so thanks much. For having you. Thank you. It was really fun. Really fun. That was Chatter, a production of Lawfare and Goat Rodeo. Please subscribe to the podcast and find us on Twitter at That Was Chatter.